When life hurts. I thought of a lot of things I could say. My last message here, in fact, had, had actually started down another trail. And uh, the Lord just kept directing me back and directing me back to Lamentations chapter 3. And so that's where I ended up today. When life hurts. Lamentations 3 verses 21 through 24. Robert McQuilkin literally had his life changed overnight after his wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. McQuilkin who was the president of Columbia Bible College and Seminary, chose to resign his position and care for his wife full-time as Alzheimer's turned her into a child unable to care for herself any longer. So whereas he, he once spent his days teaching Bible and theology and providing leadership to both a Bible college and a seminary, as well as several missionary endeavors around the world, Now he spent his days spoon-feeding his wife, changing her diapers, taking her on walks, reading to her, and keeping her from hurting herself. He he very easily could have hired help to do that. In fact, he was encouraged to do that. But you see, his wife of over 40 years became terrified when he was not there. So he chose to retire early and be with her. When challenged by well-meaning believers that stated that he was wasting his life and wasting his gifts, wasting his ministry, and felt that he should return back to the school, he said that there is something more important than ministry. It was the promise that he had made to his wife 40 years ago to care for her. One day, while he was on his knees on the kitchen floor cleaning up after her diaper had leaked onto the floor for the third time, he was overwhelmed by his emotions and the demands of caring for his wife full time, and he began to cry. And then he began to cry out to God, asking God, why had this happened? Why had God taken him out of a successful, effective, and spiritually edifying ministry where he was impacting the lives of thousands of young men and women for Christ only to hide him inside his home, taking care of his wife who no longer even knew his name or recognized who he was? Had he sinned? Had he failed the Lord in some way? Had God finally brought the hammer of judgment down for past failure? And then in his unrelenting, and then his unrelenting despair caused him to wonder and question if God really loved him anymore. If God really cared for him any longer. McQuilkin eventually recovered his sense of spiritual equilibrium And he went on to write a book, a really good book, called A Promise Kept. But the fact is is that in the midst of circumstances that produced great despair in his life, this man of God, this man who not only served God in ministry, but also prepared men and women to serve God for ministry and for missions, this man who knew God and knew Him very well, experienced doubts about God. He experienced doubts about God's love for him, and his faith began to falter. So let me ask you, have you ever been there? Have you ever been so discouraged that you begin to doubt God and his love for you? Have you ever experienced something so terrible that you actually question God's goodness? Have you ever looked at the course of your life and wondered if the negative circumstances in your life mean that God is angry with you or disappointed with you? Have you ever wondered if God has just forgotten you? He's moved on to somebody else. And finally, have you ever found yourself disappointed and doubting God's wisdom, His plan? As you compare what's going on or not going on in your life or your family's lives with other people that you know. Well, if you answered yes to any of those questions, you're in very good company. 
Marry good company. I could give you a long list of men in the Bible and women in the Bible who had those same doubts. But if you'll turn to Lamentations 3, if you're not there already, I'll show you why. And if you're wondering where Lamentations is, go to the middle of your Bible and start heading right. If you get to Ezekiel, you went too far. Lamentations chapter 3. The book of Lamentations was recorded by the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, a man who was known as the weeping prophet. So that should give you a little bit of background for what we're going to be talking about, the weeping prophet. He was struggling with depression over the loss of everything on earth that was dear to him. You see, he was the prophet that was tasked by God with warning Judah of God's judgment if God's people would not turn from their sin. But they did not listen. They did not listen to Jeremiah. God brought the judgment against Judah in the form of the Babylonian Empire whose army crushed them. And as Jeremiah walks through the ashes and the rubble that had once been the great city of Jerusalem, surveying the aftermath of the Babylonian war machine, his heart's emotions overflow onto paper and are weaved into inspired Scripture as the Holy Spirit of God guided Jeremiah's words to give us God's message to people who are suffering. And that message is this. No matter what you are going through, whether it's your own fault or someone else's fault or no one's fault, God will hold you together and get you through. He will hold you together when every part of you seems to be flying apart. And He will, if you are His, get you through. Now it's important for me to point out that the suffering and the heartache that Jeremiah is experiencing is primarily the result of other people's wrong and sinful choices. The ashes and the rubble that Jerusalem had become was the result of her own people not taking God and His commands seriously and not taking the consequences of sin seriously. Jeremiah writes in Lamentations 1 verse 9 that these people did not consider their future. Therefore they fell astonishingly. You see, the people of Jerusalem, in choosing to sin against God, did not consider the future ramifications and consequences of their sinful choices. But for that matter, who does? If we did, we wouldn't do what we do. In fact, most of us, like these people that Jeremiah is writing to as far back as Adam and Eve, really don't think about, let alone believe, that there are serious consequences for disobedience to God's Word. So so keep in mind that while most of the people in Jerusalem were experiencing the just consequences of their own sinful choices, a few like Jeremiah and the very young were suffering as innocent bystanders. They didn't do anything wrong. Yet their lives had been reduced to ashes and rubble too. And so this passage is really helpful for those who have suffered loss as a result of their own sin because it reveals God's heart for sinners who are suffering for their rebellion. But it also reveals God's heart for those who are suffering pain and heartache because of the rebellion of others. It shows God's heart toward His people who are suffering for whatever reason. So, so whether you're suffering under the consequences of past sins and rebellion toward God, or because of another person's sin, or for whatever reason, you need to hear what the Bible has to say in Lamentations 3 this morning. So, let me just bring you up to speed on Lamentations 3, and then we'll deal with our text. From verses 1 to 20... Jeremiah is describing how badly he is feeling 
about all that has happened to God's people and to himself as well. And from all that he is written, we see that he is bordering on depression and even despair. I mean, he describes himself as one who feels as though he is in a dark room with no light in verses 2 through 3. And as we read through this, consider whether you've ever felt this way or are you feeling this way right now? In verse 4, he describes himself as one who because of his pain and suffering and agitation of heart has become prematurely old. He feels like he is imprisoned by his circumstances and his pain with no way out, no escape in verses 5 through 9. He's overwhelmed with devastation and helplessness in verse 11. Bitterness toward life and those who are enjoying life are consuming his soul in verses 14 through 15. In verse 17, he says he has no peace and he can't even remember what it ever felt like to be happy. You ever had those kinds of things come into your life and you can't even remember what happiness felt like? And then in verse 18, he drops the bombshell. He no longer feels that he has the strength to go on living. And to make it even worse, he has lost his hope in God. That's the prophet Jeremiah. And all this, he with brutal honesty confesses in verses 19 through 20 has driven him into deep depression. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul also confessed in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, where he writes, For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired of life. Jeremiah and Paul both knew what it felt like to feel so hopeless that you just didn't want to go on living anymore. The brutal honesty of the Bible. And and if we felt that we could be as honest as Jeremiah and Paul, some of us might say, I've been there. I know what that feels like. Others may be crying out right now under their breaths, that's where I am right now. So so if that's where you are right now, or that's where someone you love is right now, or that's where you've been and, and you've come through that, let me share with you how God rescued Jeremiah and how God rescues us. And it's found in verses 21 through 24 as Jeremiah, in the midst of his pain and the recollection of why he is suffering such pain, remembers something else. Four truths that gave him hope and a reason to go on. Verse 21 of Lamentations 3. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. Now, before we even get into all that these verses mean, what I want you to see, first of all, is that when he is in despair, he preaches the word of God to himself. He preaches to himself. He talks to himself. You may be, other than God, the most influential person in your life. And you need to preach the word of God to you. Preach the truths of God's Word to your life. Preach the promises of God's Word to your life. Remember the promises and then talk to yourself about them. That's what Jeremiah is doing. There's not someone else in this room. It's him. He's talking to himself. Some of you do it in your cars, right? 
You see those people driving that are talking to themselves and you wonder, who are they talking to? Of course, now we know it's their phone, right? Yes, the weirdest, most embarrassing thing. You walk into the restroom at Walmart and you hear somebody say hello from the stall. Hi. Well, hi. And then you find out they're talking to someone on their phone, right? You, go, oh, and you walk out. Well, here he's talking to someone and the person he's talking to is him. And he's preaching the Word of God to himself. And he remembers four truths. Here's the first one. When tempted to give in to his despair, Jeremiah remembered and believed that the Lord loved him and would never let him go. He remembered and he believed that the Lord loved him and would never let him go. When the Bible talks about God's loving kindness, it is referring to his total, unconditional, eternal commitment to his people. That is those people who know him and who have a relationship with him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's loving kindness is God's covenant love for his people, which never lets go. It never lets go of his people, even if they at times let go of him. He does not let go. That's his promise. When he saved you, his promise, which had been forged from eternity past, given to you was, I will never let go. You are mine and I will never, ever let go of you. That, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about God's loving kindness. It's a love that is based solely upon God's decision and His choice to love you. It was not based upon you. It wasn't based upon your performance. It wasn't based upon your future performance. It was based upon Him and His choice. And He chose to love you knowing everything there is to know about you too. In other words, you can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't merit it. You can't deserve it. And that's good because that means you can't lose it either. All you can do is receive it through Christ whose death on the cross, according to Romans 5, was and is the proof of God's love for you. God's loving kindness is His unfailing, unrelenting, imperishable, indestructible, and unfathomably loyal and committed love for you. But it's also a tough love, which does not hesitate to always do what is eternally best for you, even if that temporarily feels as though it will destroy you. Oh, that we had more parents that exercised tough love with their kids. It's hard to do, isn't it? And yet, if you don't do it, you will reap disaster. We should be thankful that God is the kind of Father that loves us even when He has to hurt us. He loves us. Knowing that that is what is best. God's love is a tough kind of love sometimes. That's what the people in Jeremiah's day are experiencing. God, who, who does know the end from the beginning and thus does know the end of the story, because He planned it, knows how to love you. And He knows how to love me to the end of our stories on earth and get us safely to heaven. And when God's actions do not make sense to you today and in fact seem cruel and heartless to you, you must never lose your hope on Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know... And we know, that's what Paul writes, he says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good 
to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But you may not see that today. God does not operate on our schedule. He's not caught up in instant gratification. Instantaneous everything. He's working from and for eternity. And God because of His love for you, will make even your very worst day and hour in this temporary life to become a cause and a source of great and eternal joy in the next. Here's the second thing that Jeremiah remembered. When tempted to give in to his despair, Jeremiah remembered and he believed that the Lord's compassions for his people never fail. This I recalled in my mind, therefore I have hope. Verse 22, the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. The word for, which begins this phrase, actually is translated surely or doubtless in in many versions. And that's because the word can also mean that. And probably rightfully so here. So that we could actually read this, surely and without a doubt, God's compassions never fail. They are new every morning. This is a truth which is sometimes difficult to believe because when our trials and our difficulties rise up unbearably against us, the first one whose compassion is called into question is God's. But the fact of the matter is that God is compassionate regardless of what He's having to bring into your life today. And it's important to note that the Bible says God's compassions never cease or fail. It's plural, not singular. It's compassions. That's what we're really talking about are God's deeds and acts of compassion which flow out of His heart of compassion. And, and so these are, 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 are those sometimes seemingly small and insignificant things that happen in the days before and during and after tragedy strikes. Those little things that we, in in moments of spiritual clarity, are able to see were from God to remind us of His love, His comfort, His presence and His promise to see us through. Jeremiah wants us to understand that God's acts and His deeds of compassion, like His character, will never expire. They, like Him, will be new every morning. They will be there every morning to meet you. Robert McQuilkin, the man whose story I told at the beginning of the sermon, experienced many of these God-ordained acts of compassion. And in his book, he mentions one which occurred on a particularly hard, very difficult day of caring for his wife. He, again, after having changed her diaper several times in the morning, and after having her continue to combatively oppose him and push him away and ask him who he was, as he was dressing her for their morning walk in the park, was at the lowest point of his life and just wanted to give up. But he didn't. Somehow he just kept going and he got her outside and they began walking. And it was early. It was was unusual to see anyone else in the park at this time. But there on the side of the path was a drunk man staggering along. A drunk There was no way to avoid him. So McQuilkin and his wife kept walking, and as they were abreast of the man, he looked directly at McQuilkin. And he stared into his eyes. And McQuilkin was surprised, for he expected to hear a drunken stupor, and instead what he heard was a clear, strong voice that simply said, This is good. This is very good. 
What shocked McQuilkin is that was the question that he had for God this morning. How can this be good? It staggered McQuilkin. They kept walking. He didn't know what to make of it. As they walked past just a few feet, he took one last look over his shoulder, and sure enough, the man was still looking at him. And with a nod, he said one more time, This is good. This is very good. McQuilkin correctly, I think, saw that as one of God's many acts of compassion. Using a very unlikely person to speak to him and encourage him that what he was doing was good. Very good. In God's sight. Third thing that Jeremiah gives us as the means to move through our despair. When tempted to give in to his despair, Jeremiah remembered and he believed that the Lord's faithfulness to his people is greater than what you will ever need. Greater than what you will ever need. Verse 23, great is your faithfulness. The word great actually in Hebrew is greater than. It's talking about something that is multiplied in abundance so that it exceeds what it is being compared to. But in English, it wouldn't make sense to simply say greater is your faithfulness. So the translators say great is your your faithfulness. But it's talking about that which is greater. But it, it doesn't tell us what it's greater than. It almost leaves it as a blank. You fill in the blank. God's faithfulness is greater than What you're going through. It's greater than your sin. It's greater than your failure. It's greater than your feelings of doubt. It's greater than your despair. It's it's greater than all this. So God's faithfulness, His promise to comfort and sustain and strengthen and and hold you together will always exceed what you need. Always. Now we have a tendency, however, to project ourselves into the future and doubt whether God can meet what we will need. And God has always said, I will provide for you your daily bread. My grace will be sufficient for you. But God's grace is sufficient for us when we need God's grace to be sufficient for us. His faithful love, His faithful compassion, His faithful presence, and His faithful power to carry you through will always exceed your need. There's another sense in which this word is being used, and it is simply to communicate that God's faithfulness is greater than our unfaithfulness. As I said before, greater than our sin, greater than our consequences. Sometimes those believers who have struggled with sin in the past and are dealing with the consequences of those sins, and that probably counts for most of us, Struggle because we see the consequences for forgiven sin and we think that somehow the consequences for forgiven sin and sin that has been repented of still mean God is angry with us. That is not true. Sometimes those are God's greatest gift to us to keep us from going down a road that may be easy for us to go down. His faithfulness is greater than our weakness, our doubts, our problems, and our inability to fix them. Finally, Jeremiah tells us when tempted to give in to despair, remember and believe that the Lord alone is all you really need. That's what he did. When he was tempted to give in to his despair, he remembered and he believed that the Lord alone was all he really needed. Look at verse 24. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. 
Therefore, I have hope in him. So he has moved from having lost his hope in verse 18, going into depression in verses 19 and 20, to remembering four truths about God. That God loves him and will never let him go. That God's compassions will meet him every morning. That God's faithfulness is greater than what he's going through and will meet every need that he has. And now he says, there's one last thing. And this last thing is interesting because this we don't learn until we go through suffering. We don't really ever learn that the Lord is our portion until we come to a point in life where everything else that we have trusted in is taken away from us. The word portion comes from a Hebrew word which was used every day during the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem. The siege lasted two years, and because it lasted so long, every day food was becoming more and more scarce. And so it was rationed by the priests. And when the people would line up to receive their daily ration of food, and then they would begin to complain, as people do, and ask for more, the priests would say to them, this is all you get, because this is all you need. That's the word portion. That's what it means. So when Jeremiah says the Lord is my portion, he is saying that he has finally come to realize the Lord is all he gets because the Lord is all he needs. You see, the promise to us through the gospel is we get God. That's what God's promised in the gospel. We get him. We get him through Christ. That's the promise of the gospel. Everything else is gravy. The promise is God. It's not all the good things that God can do for us. Not all the good things that God can give us. The promise is God. But sometimes we never realize that God is all we get because God is all we need until God begins to take away everything else that is propping us up. God will have no competitors. No competitors in His people's hearts. And He will do whatever it takes to bring us to a point where we finally realize that He is our greatest treasure and pleasure in life. And sometimes that hurts. Because that means He's got to start taking away everything else that has become that for us. Jeremiah was brought to a point where he realized, wow, he who I was promised and he whom I really needed above all else, I did not lose. He never let me go. And he says, therefore, I have Hope in Him. You know, we can tie the ropes of our lives off to many different things in our lives, thinking that somehow anchoring to them are going to give us hope. For some people, it's, it's their jobs. For some, it's their ministries. Others, it's their families. Could be your health, your money. It could be a lot of things, a lot of good things. But if that's where your hope is anchored to, if that's where your significance is anchored to, you've tied your rope off to the wrong thing. And don't be surprised that God cuts it. 
There's only one that we can tie our rope off to, and that is him. Now, does that mean that everyone who is suffering is suffering because they had placed their hope in the wrong thing? No, that does not mean that. But but Jeremiah is telling us this is something that he has learned. We can suffer for many different reasons. Ultimately, we know we suffer because God is conforming us to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to give us a deeper experience of God. That even though it hurts today. Will glorify him in ways you cannot imagine and bring you a deeper sense of joy that right now you cannot even dream about because you do not have the capacity to right now. And that is the battle of faith. Once we come to realize that God is all we are promised because God is all we need and that God will never leave us nor forsake us, we will find our hope being restored and our hurt slowly but surely being healed and we will find in the end that His grace truly was sufficient for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Jeremiah's pain. Because as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, he has been able to comfort us through his pain. Father, I wonder if Jeremiah even knew that a few thousand years later there would be people sitting in a room hearing his story and being able to be comforted through a very painful experience that he had to persevere through. Father, we we just don't know how far our stories reach. We, we, We don't know the extent that you are going to use our stories, our, our lives. We have no idea. All we know is that you are going to use them. All we know is that, that you're going to do something. That, that you do have a plan. You have a grand story that you're putting together. And, and it includes us and it includes our joys, but it also includes our pain. Help us, Father. When we despair of going another step, when we're ready to throw in the towel, when we can't imagine what happiness even feels like anymore, Father, cause us to stop and remember. You're never going to let us go. You love us too much to do that. You're going to meet us every morning with new compassions to get us through that day. You are more faithful than what we need. And you are the promise that we will not lose. And we will thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.